Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you are good today, even though it's raining. And the month of January is all rain. It's easy to uh, yeah, it's, uh, easy to say uh, see the weather. It's always raining. <laughs> Now let's all stand and worship the Lord together. And you know, today we are go we are going to sing a great song, and we encourage everyone to sing with your heart. And today, uh, at uh, praying church, we're not having a sing along, but we encourage everyone to uh, sing with us and worship the Lord with all our hearts. Amen.
Omar and Lewin. So we welcome them. And um, let's go around and uh, sing and uh, greet each other as we sing the next song. And we have a visitor also on, uh, on my left. Yeah, welcome everyone. God is great.
continue this morning in the, in the heart and posture of prayer. God, you know when I sit, you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You have searched me, Lord, and you know. God, no matter where we go, in the tallest mountain, in the deepest of seas, Lord, you are there. You are both before us, Lord, and you are after us, Lord, to take care of us. And God, even if we venture into unknown territory, even when we go into um, situations where we are not in control, God, you are there. You're telling us be strong and be courageous. You're telling us to abide in your God. Where no one loves us like you. No one knows us like you. In our deepest, darkest secrets, Lord, you know that. And in our moments where we feel on top of the world, in the moments where um, we feel like we've made the greatest accomplishments and we've done everything that we could do, God, you're still calling us into deeper relationship with you. And God, that's what we want our lives to be. That's what we want our stories to be like. To be written by you. And Lord, sometimes that, that means going out into the other. Sometimes that means letting go of control. Letting go of, of our dreams, of our aspirations, Lord, for even greater things that you have in store for us. And God, we're trusting you. Not because... Um, not because we come here every Sunday and learn about um, your word. We will trust in you because you are God over the universe. You are God over, over all things, Lord. Everything that we see, everything that we don't see, you have authority over it. And so, Lord, we come with strength and with courage into the unknown, Lord. We, we come following your guidance, following your will. And Lord, even when your will doesn't sound or doesn't look uh, clear to us, God, we have your word. You're telling us, you're speaking to us every day. You're molding us into the image of your son. And so Lord, we, we praise you for that. We praise you because you're taking care of us. We're praising you because we, we know that you are there when we are hurt. You are there when we need you. And Lord, you are there even when we seem to forget your name. You're still taking care of us. So we want to thank you. We want to praise you, not just with our words, but with our lives as well. God, may everything that we do be a testimony of our devotion to you. And may your love permeate through us, making the salt and light to the world. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to be here, to hear your word, and to partake in the Holy Church. Thank you. Amen.
So we thank you, God, for your death on the cross. We thank you for loving us. We receive this elements, recognize it, for what you have done for us personally. So we are still in the case. So take the brand and do away till we get together.
saw him was suffering, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Enjoy again. doubt or are you not a child of God? Have you thought about you not a child of God? Look at verse 19. Verse 19. It's saying to us here, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and we show our hearts before him. Last Sunday, we look at verses 10 to 18, and we find that uh, our love for others, particularly the brethren, prove our salvation. And today, <clears throat> we're going to look at our confidence coming before God. Verse 15 for a moment. And John wants those who are not general believers to realize and to start to doubt their salvation for the purpose that they might be sure of their salvation. So we start in verse 20. Looking at verse 20 in the scripture. If we think our sins are bad, and if we start to doubt our salvation because we have been a killer, a thief, or someone who had done something wrong, you know, it was a sin, then I'm talking about the habitual lifestyle of sin before God. If we think our sins are bad, it says here, God is greater. God is greater. God is holy and God sees our sins. 
those that will see them through the eyes of the righteous. The righteous God. And his holy eyes that cannot look upon our iniquities, our wrongdoings. So, if that is you today, you probably have doubt your salvation. And your heart is condemning me. That is a message for us. So is anyone in this room that have experienced that you doubt because of that condemnation inside of you? After doing a sin, after committing wrongdoing, then you feel if I'm really a child of God. Let me remind you. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. The Lord knows those who are His. And let anyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. It is a warning. It is a warning to the condemning heart. We saw a passage by him, 2 Peter 1.10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And thirdly, 2 Corinthians 13.5, beautiful words, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize that by yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to be the text. So back into our text again in verse 20, in 1 John 3, verse 20. <clears throat> He speaks of the condemned Christians. Verse 20. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows everything. We cannot hide anything. And I like to put this verse in a context, proper context. We have studied this epistle, and many of you have been in the Bible study. And you probably know now it's about the assurance of our salvation. It is about having a relationship with Christ. And there are influences of false teachings in the church that they are beginning to doubt their own salvation. So now we know why. First John 5, 11 and 12. Memorize that. And you doubt your salvation. First and five, eleven and twelve, and this is a testimony God has given us what? Eternal life. So this life is in his son. He who is the son does not know life. He who is the son of God has had eternal life. So actually, he, in the same first John. That I quoted you in the next verse, we could probably add verse 13. And it says this I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. For what? That you may know that you have eternal life. So, can I boldly say then, maybe. <clears throat> What our need is not lack of assurance, probably lack of fellowship, probably lack of coming with the leaders to learn and grow in the scripture, probably lack of understanding, probably lack of conviction. That's probably why. If I'm guilty, if I'm condemned, and John is saying to us, that we are assured that we should come before God with confidence. And we should know that we have eternal life. So again, my question to you is, a 
as Christians, can we trust our conscience? Because back to our case, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. So, I know the conscience that he has given us, I would say they're a gift to us from him. But sometimes our fingers and our feet can lead us astray. And I'd like to illustrate that to you very quickly in Acts chapter 26. In Acts 26, Paul is saying here, <coughs> picking up from verse 9, he faced himself with a great pie and saying, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only lock up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests. But when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Paul killed a lot of Christians. So, but I'd like you to see chapter 24 of the book of Acts. The same Paul in verse 16. He said his words. Remember, he's telling his testimony. And he said this, So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and men. And now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation with the percent offerings. So it's Paul who had a conscience coming from God. On both occasions, in exercising his conscience, at the same time, his obedience to his God. So what this passage is talking about to us, we find even Paul before his conversion, there was that, I would call it evil influence, and his conscience that he mistook as being God's influence. He thought he was doing a good job representing his God, but yet he was not. But now in chapter 24, he was converted, he became a Christian, and he knows better. Now, what is the point that I'm trying to say to you? The point is, I guess Martin Luther answers this, my conscience is captured in the Word of God. Is the Word of God that give us the clarity, that give us the rest and the peace that we need. My conscience is coming to the word of God. So if you go back to our text in 1 John, let me ask you a question. What is the specific truth that regulates our sensitive conscience? I'd like you to look at the last part of verse 20. And it says that God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. Do we have a problem understanding that? He knows everything. We cannot hide anything from him. So maybe some of you, you have a heart that is condemned. Maybe a bad conscience toward God because of something that you have done. God knows about that. Thank you. Whatever you do. Whatever you did. And he knows more about your sinful activity than you do. God also knows if you really love him. Remember, he is God. Can't hide. Truly, deep down, underneath of all the condemnation that you have, he knows if you are his own. And I'd like you to hear this. Listen to me. No matter what way our heart is feeling, even how sensitive your conscience is, or how much it condemns us, God has forgiven us if you are a child of God. 
no matter what. I look at Romans 8, the whole thing, Romans 8 towards the end. That is a reality for you if you are a child of God. If you receive Christ in your life, if God does not condemn you, why should you condemn yourself? Does it make sense? First verse of Romans 8, it says, There is no therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this great epistle, John, that he had written, inspired by the world, by God's Spirit, is telling us that we should have confidence towards God. Because first of all, God does not want us to feel condemned. And honestly, from time to time, of course, we fail. But the master knows truly what's going on in ourselves if we love him. But here's the secret, my brothers and my sisters, secret. If you want to be a confident Christian, you confess your sin, you repent of it, and keep yourself from falling. It is the power of God that does that. No wonder we have 1 John 1, 9. That is a secret that we have in the same book. So let Lucas look at this confident Christian that we find in verses 21 to 24. And this is the message of God for all of us. It starts on verse 21. I'll give you three things. <laughs> when you have confidence before God, number one, it will affect your approach to God. When you have confidence, when you know that you love your parents, your mom and dad, It's very easy for you to think. Very easy for you to go to your mom and dad to ask for something, isn't it? It's the same thing here. Verse 19. By this we shall know, John says, that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Verse 19. Now let me just maybe explain a little bit so we understand it better. The word reassure our heart before him has been translated in another version and it says this. This is how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. In his presence. So our hearts are at peace with God when we were in his presence. There's another translation that put it like this. Then we'll be confident when we stand before the Lord. And the sense is this. Here is the way we can know when we come in the very presence of God. That we are confident. We are at peace. We don't feel condemned. We don't feel like running away from His presence. Having confidence before the very face of the Holy God of Heaven. We can come to Him. The question is. Do you have the confidence coming before God? Have you experienced sometimes you pray? You pray, but yet you have doubt in your mind. Is God here? Is God listening? Is God answering my prayer? So the word confidence was used here three times by the Lord of John. And the word confidence from the Greek word parousia, he referred to the, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to John, that's called a Bima judgment, the great white throne judgment that all of us will face, all believers. And in chapter two, verse eight, in the same idea in chapter 4, verse 17, 
we find the same thing. The throne of judgment. When Christ comes and we stand before the beam of judgment, we will not be ashamed and we will have the confidence coming before him. But I don't think he was preparing to that. In this instance, I think John is referring to confidence in coming boldly in prayer. Back to verse 19. The confidence in his presence. And chapter 5, verse 14. Look at verse 14. It says the same thing. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, what? He will hear us. That is the confidence that we have. So, God is telling us a very important aspect in our Christian life. That's why we have to really understand what John is saying. The confidence that we have before God in His presence. And in this context, I'd like you to understand, we cannot be at peace and confident in the presence of God. In this context, you probably have studied some verses here already in your Bible study. In this context, you cannot stand at peace with God if you have if you are harboring, if you have bitterness against your fellow brothers and sisters, are you getting me? That is the context. You've probably been studying already. It flows through from the beginning to the end. We just finished the whole book after third John. It flows through. The love for one another basically demonstrates that I have Christ in my life. Amen. That's what we're saying. So here in the proper context, he's saying, if you're not at peace with your brethren, you cannot have peace with God. Did you get that? If you don't love, Others, particularly in the fellowship, you will be at peace with God. That is very serious. And John is saying that's why Christ died, not only to give us the conscience toward God, but to give us a good conscience toward your fellow brother and sister. Jesus shed his blood on the cross and died for all of us to make us right with God. But how often do we dwell on the fact that he didn't just shed blood to bring us to God. He shed blood that we should be right and have a friend. Are you getting that? That's exactly what I said. So when you're looking through this, it's a very serious thing because it happens in a fellowship and God is reminding us, let us love one another from the beginning to the end. First John, second John, and third John talks about loving one another. It's a very important thing that God desires for all of us. Number two. It will affect our approach to God, and secondly, it will affect our answers to prayer. Very simple. Look at verse 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. John is saying that if our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence to come before God. But we have only confidence to come to Him, but to call upon Him and to request things 
from him. Have the confidence to believe and expect that we're going to get them. Now why is that? Because we're not only right with God, but we are right with our fellow brothers and sisters. It's a matter of serious stuff. It's not like I'm exaggerating on this point, right? <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Because I like it to see at this point. Turn your Bible to Matthew 5. You all know it's a sermon of the mount. I like you to see this from the words of Christ. Matthew 5, verse 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, <coughs> leave your gift there before the altar and go first. Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer you a gift. Verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are knowing him in support. As your accuser again, you will be put to the and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. See how important it is. What is the implication? The implication is this. Don't come and worship God and think that you can have a face-to-face -face communion and look into God's eyes and raise your hand in worship, coming together and sing with your fellow brothers and sisters if you cannot look into the eyes of your brother. I plan to do that loud, but not with my voice. Probably it will speak better when it's like this. Don't you get that? You cannot worship, you cannot come boldly to him. If you don't look your brothers and sisters to your eyes. If you are serious, that's what God said. Again, from the beginning to the end, love one another. If you claim to know Christ, and you say you love God, but you hate your brother, it's a contradiction. Last night we talked about being asked about Third John talks about that. Being asked about shows that you love others. <coughs> That's a wonderful study of the Bible. Look at verse 7 with me. I'm going to skip the injunction for the wives. So verse 7 says, Husbands, lead with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the little person, since they are cursed with you in the grace of God. So that you your prayers may be in them. And then in the next verses, finally he says, 
brotherly love in all those kind of things. Suffering, you know, for righteousness sake. So at home, if we want to see our prayer answered at home, if you want to go to God with a confident heart, I guess the principle is the same as Psalm 66, verse 18. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. So back into our text. If you look at verse 22 with me, if we keep his commandments, and if you do what he pleases, listen to this, verse 22. Whatever we ask, we will see from him. But you have that. Whatever we ask, we will see from him. <coughs> well, of course, it's not a, it is, it is not a promise that anything we ask, we will have it. Because chapter 5, 14 clarifies that. Chapter 5, verse 14. So that just to put it in a, in a biblical way, or to answer the prosperity of the gospel, he says, this is the covenant that we have to worry about. If we ask according to his will, at our will, to his will, the promise is he will hear us. Now, what is the point? Listen, the point is this. If we come and approach God, and there's nothing between us and God, there's no barrier. And there's nothing between us and our brother and sisters, and nothing between our wives and our husbands. We will be filled with God's presence as we come and approach Him. And therefore, when we were filled with the Spirit, when we were filled with the love of God and the understanding of who He is and what is good for us, we will be filled with His will. And when we're filled with His will, we don't ask for anything that outside of His will is a crack. We're guided. Our thoughts is being carried through when the Holy Spirit within us. We can come to us, come to the come to before Him, what is will for us. So I want you to see how this confidence is not having a condemning heart, a bad conscience, but having a conscience toward God and toward fellow men. This affects our Christian life. And it gives us confidence in approaching God. Finally, there you go. It gives us a confidence to abiding in Christ and Christ abiding within us. The last two verses says those. I call it mutual abiding. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. By this we know that they are by this but it's beautiful. Yes, when our conscience is right, right with God, because it's been washed and sprinkled with the precious blood of the Lamb, we just remember the death of Christ on the cross. We have confessed our sins to God and to man. We make ourselves right towards another believer, another brother or sister. And put all things right, that is abiding. And it is this confidence of our heart that is clean, pure, a conscience that is clear, that causes Christ to abide in us, in us, in Him, and it is through the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. That's exactly what is saying here. By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. That 
That is the test of Christ abiding. He will manifest his presence in fulfilling the three tests that we that looked before. Remember the doctrinal test. And turn it to <coughs> verse 23, the same doctrinal test. Would you pass? And then we looked at before, which is in verse 23, 22 and 24, the moral test to live a life, a vision life with him. Would you pass the moral test? And then the social test, the loving one another. And how could the spirit of God dwell in us if we are not obedient? But if we give him the full control of our life, John is saying, and it's all about it. We will love one another. So listen, if you're a believer in Christ, it will manifest. It will be proved and demonstrated in your life. Now, Romans 5, verse 5. It says there, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If you claim to be a Christian today, right now, that's a reality to you. The love of God has been poured out into your hearts. You have the love of God within you. Let me connect with Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit is witnessing with our spirit that we are children of God. And what is the result? It brings confidence. And you follow it. The Spirit himself within us, God's Spirit, gives us the confidence of God before him. Give us the confidence to really worship God. So, as we close, do you lack assurance of your salvation? Do you feel that you are a child of God after examining your heart? But you have a heart condemning you. You're sure you're saved. But maybe you're harboring hatred to your brother and your sister. It's hindering the abiding of the Spirit in your heart. And you're abiding in Christ and manifesting the Spirit. It's a message to honor. But what do you do? We study from the beginning. God is greater than our heart. Remember the hymn that says, His grace is greater than all our sin. So come before God with this prayer. May this be a message to all of us. I really thank you. It is a reminder to the church. It is a reminder to individual Christians that the love that is coming from you must be evident. Forgive us, Lord. But sometimes it doesn't show. But here, We could come before you. If we confess our sin of faith, in faith we just to forgive us, to be cleansed from all our righteousness. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have the confidence before you. Receive also our offering and tithes. It is our worship in Jesus' name.
virtue to tomorrow morning. And I say, yeah, just to come and be grateful. So a body of believers, would you remember him in your prayers tomorrow? But we're going to pray for him now. Pray for him tonight. we we'll pray for him tomorrow. It will be a long procedure. Six, eight hours. And let's pray for him. Thank you, Shepard. your son to die on the cross that we might be saved. How much more did we come to you to pray for our brother that you will grant our request according to your prayer. Amen. Father God, I pray, we pray as a congregation that you will be with him. Encourage his heart. Build him with your spirit, Lord. Make him the quiet assurance that you are in control in everything that's happening to him. Because you are God. You are the sovereign and almighty God who loves us so much, who loves him so much. And we commit him to you, even the whole family. Also, Sister Raquel, that you tell me that peace that comes from you, that pass it on the tongue, mm -hmm. that you are our God, who will be with them during this process. Pray for successful surgery, Lord. Give you the doctors. Give them wisdom that they need. That this surgery will bring glory and honor <coughs> to the almighty name of our Lord. Lord, we're looking forward to the testimony, Lord, that once again we'll hear by our Alex testifying your goodness and greatness in his life, even in his family. We commit him to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Mm -hmm. Yes, God, and just to echo all the prayers that we've said on the Lord, we'll pray for you because we believe in your power. Amen. And we're believing in your faithfulness. Lord, Brother Alex just go into his procedure tomorrow with the conference. Mm -hmm. Father, you know, Lord, and may he return to us next week with a new mm -hmm. testimony of mm -hmm. your grace and your love. Because Lord, you don't have an absent God. You don't have a powerless God. You are all powerful. And you are loving us. And so Lord, I pray, make a new testimony in Brother Alex's life. And may we all be encouraged in your power. 
is I deserve the glory that you allow us to Before we uh, close in prayer, we also saw the brothers and sisters who need into prayer. Sister Lee, that uh, seems to be for her. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's good for us to know so we could pray effectively. If I could have the uh, fellowship uh, our groups to meet after uh, you know fellowship over here, we can just all uh, uh, get up to date for uh, the Valentine's party. And if I could have Pastor and Pastor Austin join us, please. Thank you. God bless. Yeah. Thank you. And a quick announcement uh, on your bulletin. If you notice, actually there's two activities happening on. February 17. One is the couples at night at 6.30, I think. Six, yes. To all couples, if you're a couple, you're all invited. So there will be a special guest that night. And also at uh, 8 to 12.30, the same day, uh, February 17, will be the BCBC uh, equipping your serve. Okay? So we'll be equipped and encouraged to serve more best we can. And it will be a training and just act a sign-up sheet. I prepared a sign-up sheet. There's one in the other back. Let me know, the pastor know, or any of our elders here for planning to come. This is for our own benefit and for the good of our church. So we can all be equipped to serve our Lord. Amen? Amen. There's a $15, sorry, $12 if you pre-register. So if we get your name ahead, we can email them. You only pay $12. But if not, you have to pay $15 on the door. So we want to see, if you are an elder bird, save $3, that would be great, amen? So let me know, or let Pastor know any of our elders. February 17, 8 to 12.30 uh, p.m. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay, thank you. like to greet also the birthday celebrant, Brother Joel, on the 9th. You're welcome to invite us, Brother Joel. <laughs> and uh, Evika on the 10th, and Gail also, and Papa John. We celebrate with you. We're happy. <laughs> you know, the message is very timely uh, as we we learn about uh, loving our neighbors, loving our brothers, our sisters, and loving our God. And we can we have a full confidence that we can call him our father. Amen. And he is a good good father. Let's all stand and sing.
this now go into a blessing that we'll meet again. In Jesus' name. Amen.